Professor Eli, this is the third interview. Last time we followed the list of your notable achievements which you kindly provided. I've listened to what you said very carefully and I found it fascinating. But there are three points which I wonder if we could amplify. First of all, in the 1940s you spent four years in the States and then you came back to Britain and both countries were at war with Germany. One had been very badly affected, the other far less so. You were an impressionable boy then, and I wonder if you can remember some of the comparisons that must have hit you quite forcibly when you returned. You say that I was an impressionable boy then. Uh, I suppose I was, but I'm not sure that I always was conscious of the nature of the impressions that I was receiving. However, there were, of course, significant differences between my life in America and my life in Cambridge. In America, I'd been very much on my own. I had become much more self-reliant. I, I, I organized my life as I thought best. When I came back to England, I fell immediately under the <coughs> considerable sway of my father, who had certain views as to how I should behave. And I think I mentioned that when I came back, I had an American accent, that I had to get rid of this. I was told to sit in my room and listen to the wireless in English, which I, which I did, and in due course, I learnt to speak English. But as between the two countries, of course, there were massive differences. In America, one, for example, was not exposed to rationing. There was plenty of food and so on. Come back to England, uh, one was in the middle of rationing. The war was still on. I came back just after the invasion of Europe, D-Day, and <clears throat> so I, when I went back to school at Harrow, I went back for uh, another year of the war in Europe. And it was only in May '46, I think, that, that uh, Germany collapsed. And thereafter, the, the Japanese war had also been brought to an end. So I came back to a, a wartime, uh, war-oriented country. Uh, and one was one was conscious of that, but the effect, effect upon me personally was really, I think, quite limited. I just got on and did the things that I was told to do. <laughs> that brings us then to the next point, which is the Sinai mining and Suez. These were points which we never spoke about in the previous interview, Suez and oh, yes. Sinai mining. Well, uh, I do remember very well uh, the development of the uh, Suez uh, conflict in 1956. Uh, I was then living in a flat in Chaucer Road in Cambridge. And uh, when I heard the news about the Egyptian nationalization of British assets, I remember uh, saying to my wife, in a gleeful voice, happy days are here again, by which I meant that there would undoubtedly be a lot of new work uh, to cope with at the bar, and indeed that there was. Uh, I was uh, taken into the Suez matter by, by John uh, Foster, who was the leading counsel instructed by Linklater's on behalf of the Suez Canal Company, and our first task was to uh, consider what devices might be available to the company uh, to alleviate their position. They'd been dispossessed from uh, their control of the canal and, of course, from the revenue accruing to them from the passage of ships through the canal. And we had to figure out what, if anything, there was that we could do. And <clears throat> uh, our reaction to that was to suggest, though we realized that there were significant legal uh, limitations upon its prospects, the device of threatening to sue uh, those, the owners of those vessels that passed through the canal under Egyptian control, who paid their dues not to the Suez Canal Company, but to the Egyptian government. And this certainly bothered uh, the owners of ships who didn't want to have to pay double tolls. Uh, but uh, we never actually uh, had to sue anybody because that idea uh, faltered quite quickly. 
Uh, <coughs> and then another aspect of the, the Suez matter was that um, individual British companies found that their assets had been uh, seized by the Egyptians. One company in particular was the Sinai Mining Company, uh, which <coughs> had uh, access uh, to uh, manganese deposits in Egypt, for which there was a very specialized and limited international market. And when they were cut off from their supplies, they uh, threatened the Egyptian government with the same kind of proceedings that Anglo-Iranian had threatened the Iranians in relation to oil. They said that anybody who buys uh, manganese from uh, the Egyptian government without acknowledging our title or paying for it, uh, we will sue. Again, uh, this didn't, didn't need to happen because that threat was sufficient to inhibit uh, normal purchasers from buying manganese ore from the Egyptians. The, the purchasers did not want to buy a lawsuit. Uh, and it was only after the um, settlement of the, the crisis by the financial agreement that it was possible for Egypt to resume uh, sales of manganese ore. And that was again an interesting application of uh, what, what had by then come to be called the Rosemary Doctrine. I think I mentioned last time that I was involved in that case because uh, John McGaw, who had been instructed to uh, conduct the proceedings in Aden, had turned to me for some help on the international law side. Now, the interesting point that I didn't really make last time was this. Uh, the attitude of English lawyers towards recognition of foreign expropriatory legislation was at that time totally dominated by their recollection of cases like Luther against Segor and Princess Pele Olga against Weiss, both in the 1920s, involving assets that the Russians had seized in Russia, which were subsequently exported to the United Kingdom. And the English courts had said that if the purchaser of those assets had acquired a good title under Russian law, the place where the goods were situated at the time of the transfer of title, then the English courts would recognize it. In effect, they were saying, or they were understood as saying, that the English courts will not question the validity of the seizure under the foreign law. Now the significance of Rosemary was that it in introduced an additional element into the equation. It said, yes, Luther and Sego may well be right, but that was because the wood, the, the, the commodity in question in that case, the wood had belonged to Russian nationals, and therefore the seizure by Russia did not involve any violation of international law. But in the case of the Rosemary, the situation was different because the assets were claimed or belonged uh, to a foreign national, i.e. Anglo-Iranian. And so the seizure by the Iranians of the oil was a violation of the rights of uh, Anglo-Iranian uh, under international law. They were entitled to protection from expropriation without compensation. So it was the introduction into the thinking on that subject of that element, that is to say that if there was an international wrong involved, the transfer of title in the state of origin would not be recognized. That was the novel element and one in which I, I think I played a, a significant role in collecting up the material and preparing the arguments. Most interesting. Could we talk then about the British South Africa Company, British South Africa Company 1964? Yes, so around about that time, uh, <coughs> the independence of Northern Rhodesia was approaching. The British South Africa Company had uh, significant uh, rights to royalties in respect of activity in that country, which it was about to lose. And so consideration was being given to the measures that might be taken to protect uh, 
the company's interests. I can't remember the exact details of it, but I do recall that uh, Morris Bathurst, who was uh, then a silk, and I were uh, instructed to consider these matters, and we came up with a certain proposals, which I think indirectly led to a negotiated solution of the problem of the company, but did not give the company the kind of compensation that it sought. Interesting. So, Ellie, we come then to the rest of the topics on your list, Polina, followed by several other topics that you have listed for this 1960s. And so, uh, going on with the rather rough outline that I prepared, <coughs> there's one item that uh, uh, calls for mention, and that is the development of the so-called Neareri Doctrine in relation to state succession and treaties. Uh, I was instructed by the Attorney General of Tanganyika, uh, as it then was, to consider what position Tanganyika should take in relation to the proposal by the British government that Tanganyika should conclude with the United Kingdom a so-called inheritance agreement, that is to say, an agreement under which Tanganyika undertook to take over uh, the, the liabilities as well as the rights under various treaties which had been concluded by Britain during the pre period of, of colonial administration uh, and uh, which would have normally persisted uh, after the independence of the country. Well, the first suggestion I made uh, to Tanganyika was that they should ask the British government for a list of the treaties that the British government considered would be taken over by this inheritance agreement. Uh, the Foreign Office produced a list, but this list had certain very significant omissions, whether deliberate or uh, negligent, uh, one could not tell. But I was uh, obliged to advise the Tanganyikan government that in effect they were being asked to take a pig in the poke. That is to say, uh, they were asked to take over all treaty obligations without having a list of, uh, a complete list of treaty obligations. So I suggested to them that instead of doing that, they should declare uh, that <coughs> they would take over, uh, that they would require a period in which to consider what treaties they would take over. They would then notify the parties concerned and act accordingly. Either they would uh, acknowledge their continuance or they would deny their continuing uh, relevance. And this approach was embodied in a statement by the then Prime Minister of Tanganyika, Mr. Nyerere, and became known as the Nyerere Doctrine. Uh, so that was one item in, in the 60s. And then uh, one can go on uh, to... Did I, did I speak last time about Uganda and the Lost Counties. I think I did. You did. Yes, I did. So uh, we then come to the Barcelona Traction case. Or did I deal with that also? We've dealt I with that. I dealt with that also. So the next thing I think that uh, calls for mention is the uh, Palena case between Chile and uh, Argentina. I was instructed on behalf of Chile a London firm of solicitors, Messrs. Bischoff and Co. were involved. The Palena dispute related to the boundary between Chile and Argentina uh, quite a way south uh, from Santiago and uh, <coughs> related to an area in and around the river Encuentro. Uh, and the question was whether it was Chilean or Argentinian. There was a, a particular piece of disputed territory uh, that was inhabited by uh, Chileans, so, so Chile contended. And uh, my instructing solicitor, John Walford, and I uh, went out there together to look at the area, and I remember riding over the ground uh, <coughs> up this valley, California, and visiting all these families' 
that lived there. It was an interesting valley because it had been it had been very heavily forested, and then there had been a, a great forest fire that destroyed the trees, and so the trees were lying on the ground like matchsticks, and one had to find one's way round them. Then, in the normal process of regeneration, the the seeds from the trees would have taken root, and the forest would have uh, built up again over a period of years. However, it had not then uh, yet done so. So, uh, John Wolfe and I uh, traversed all this territory, and in this case, I had the inestimable help of my Cambridge colleague, John Collier, who was then a a young fellow of Trinity Hall. And uh, between us, we worked out exactly what families lived were, where, what families lived where, and uh, we found a rather strange occurrence that in a given family where there might be a father but no wife and a group of children, the families increased year by year, uh, obviously uh, self-induced. Uh, 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 it was a, an interesting phenomenon. But anyway, we, we identified these families as children, and that was uh, significant in helping the tribunal to determine that the Valle California fell within Chile. I recall that during the hearings, Lord McNair, who was presiding over the tribunal, uh, when I was arguing about the, the Valle California, said to me, Mr. Lauterpark, you convey the impression of knowing this area as well as your own garden, uh, which I had uh, temporarily to admit. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, in due course, uh, Lord McNair and his colleagues, uh, uh, the then uh, Secretary of the Royal Geographical Society and a, a, a British Army a General, uh, determined where the boundary line should run. This was then implemented by a demarcation carried out uh, by uh, a group of British soldiers, engineers, under the uh, command of Colonel Rushworth, who was a, a, an excellent cartographer. And that was the Palena case, and, and it was acceptable. The decision was, a, so to speak, a fair compromise between the claims of both sides and was accepted by, by both. The implications of the decision were subsequently written about by Athene Monkman in a remarkable article uh, published in the British Yearbook of International Law on Territory and Boundaries. It was an interesting case. Uh, unfortunately, I did not speak Spanish at the time, and I failed to have the sense uh, to learn Spanish then, with the result that I, uh, in my later involvement in these boundary cases in Latin America, I didn't have the Spanish that I would have liked, and probably uh, was not invited to participate in others on a ground of that language defect. Uh, international lawyers certainly need to know some languages. I would have thought that, obviously, French and Spanish were essential. German, not so important. Right. And uh, I uh, <coughs> was <coughs> guilty, I think, of the rather Philistine observation that if something isn't written in English, <laughs> then it isn't worthwhile <laughs> reading, which, of course, isn't true. But there's so much written in English that one can't cope with everything that is written. Anyway, so we go on from the uh, Palena case uh, to uh, the uh, little work that I wrote in uh, 1967, I say little work, it was a, a, a volume that was eventually published uh, uh, by the, the Anglo-Israel uh, Association on Jerusalem and the Holy Places, and it, it came to about uh, uh, 70 pages or so. And uh, it took a great deal of labor on my part because it became necessary to examine in detail the legal basis of the establishment of the State of Israel. Up till that time, there had been no such analysis. I was very pleased when Julius Stone, who was a very considerable uh, international lawyer, in later years uh, said that he agreed with my approach. But uh, it was subject to criticism, and obviously there is room for criticism, uh, uh, by, by the same Athene Monkman, who was given the book to review by uh, <coughs> the editor of the British Yearbook of International Law at that time, uh, Ian Brownlee. Uh, I was a little bit miffed that Ian should have given uh, a book to be uh, of mine uh, 
to be reviewed by a lady, no matter how capable, who was my research student. I thought that she could not have quite the detachment that I would have liked, or the authority at that time. However, <coughs> she identified certain features with which she disagreed. But, and the, the, the book has uh, remained on people's shelves and been looked at with, with approval. But of course, it reflected a position in 1967, which has not been overtaken by subsequent events. But everything I said then has to be read in the light of the mass of subsequent uh, Security Council resolutions and other acts of international organizations. Uh, then we go on from uh, that. And do bear in mind, it is, it is a danger in, in my moving from episode to episode in the uh, practice of international law that one may forget that uh, I am at the same time as all this uh, continuing with a full-time teaching commitment in the university. I was doing 12 hours of supervision uh, in Trinity each week and four hours of lectures in the university each week. So I really had quite a heavy academic program. At, ab at about that time, I developed a new approach to the uh, tedious uh, burden of reading undergraduate essays every week. The normal practice had previously been uh, that uh, prior to each supervision, uh, the undergraduate would hand in his essay, which he would expect to have read before the supervision, and uh, or if not by then, to be read soon after and returned to him at the next supervision. Uh, but uh, I found that uh, it's difficult to keep up with, with these uh, essays. So instead I devised a system by which I indicated to each undergraduate uh, at times at which I would invite them to come and sit with me while I read the essays in their presence. So that in addition to their regular supervision times, they had these, these uh, essay reading times. And I would read the essays. I would al allocate 20 minutes per student with a view to reading in 10 minutes each of two essays. And I was able thus to convey to the uh, student a much clearer impression of my reaction to what he was doing. I could indicate that it was right or wrong or well-written or poorly reasoned. And I believe that it was much more satisfactory for the student to bring his essay into the room with him and take it out with him, it having been read in the meantime. So I had an elaborate program of these individual supervisions. Did, did they feel they benefited from that? I think they did, yes. Uh, they, they seemed happy. I, I had a, a system of traffic lights installed outside my, my room, and if the light was red, nobody uh, was allowed to knock on the door, and it was only when it turned green and one undergraduate emerged that the next undergraduate could enter and so on. Oh, we all had a nice time, but it was a much more effective method mm -hmm. of dealing with written work than the, the traditional method, which I believe is nonetheless still widely used. So um, uh, in the uh, middle 60s, uh, we, we began to have to face problems relating to the delimitation of maritime areas. And the first case that came before the International Court was the North Sea Continental Shelf case. Uh, in fact, case, cases in the plural, because there were two, one between uh, Denmark and Germany, the other between uh, Holland and Germany. And the issue was how to uh, demarcate their respective areas of continental shelf in the North Sea. Denmark, uh, Denmark's interest in the matter was largely uh, controlled by the firm of Moller, big ship owners and uh, people who were involved in deep sea exploration. And they instructed uh, myself and Sir Humphrey Waldock, the, the professor at Oxford, to assist them. I uh, did a great deal of the written work in the evolution of, of that case. Uh, Sir Humphrey uh, uh, did all of the advocacy and it kept the ICJ proceedings rather to himself, uh, not that that mattered. But 
the case did lead to a, a somewhat unexpected decision by the court, uh, whereas uh, Denmark had been claiming that the <coughs> delimitation should take place on the basis of the doctrine of equi equidistance, that is to say, a line that was equidistant from the nearest points on the coasts of the two states, uh, <coughs> the court ended up with a somewhat adjusted view of the matter, which in introduced into the uh, problem the application of equitable principles. Now, that was a, a, a rather surprising at the time. It's interesting, Sir Eli. I was looking at a map before this interview, and I noticed that the coastline of Germany is concave, which would, yes. of course, affect the... Well, that, 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 yeah. that is what um, uh, created the problem, because by applying a doctrine of equidistance, uh, Germany's uh, area was significantly restricted. And I remember very well uh, the one of the counsel for Germany, I think it was Professor Jeneke, uh, uh, getting up before the court and putting his hand on the area that would have been Germany's on the application of the doctrine of equidistance. He put his hand on the map and he said, too small. <laughs> that was a very <laughs> effective piece of advocacy because it obviously uh, hit home to the court. Yeah. And the, the court said that there had to be a negotiated settlement, and eventually there was, which gave <coughs> Germany a somewhat larger area. Did that mean that they gained access to the oil field that Denmark had its eye on? Well, uh, it wasn't clear then, nor is it quite clear now, uh, what oil there was in that oh. area. But the court took the view that the existence or not of oil fields was not the determining factor. It was a, mm. an essentially legal rather than an economic division. See. Well, Sir Eli, we come then to the 70s, which saw continued upheaval on the international scene, and the first item on your list here is the Ixod case. Well, I think that um, it might be better to lead up to that by referring to a matter that took place in the 60s, namely the development of the ICSID Convention. Ah, the ICSID Convention is the convention establishing the International Centre for the Settlement of Investment Disputes, which was a major development. Up till that time, and indeed afterwards, the big issue in uh, matters relating to the treatment of alien property was the extent of compensation to be paid when such property was nationalized by the host state. The Americans had developed before the war the so-called, um, uh, well not the so-called, had developed a doctrine uh, uh, requiring the payment of prompt, adequate and effective compensation. And it was this doctrine which is obviously uh, asserted, adhered to and asserted by uh, the governments of uh, investment-making companies. But um, agreement uh, on that formula could not be uh, obtained from developing countries or investment-receiving countries. And the question, therefore, was really how was this impasse to be overcome? At that time, the General Council of the World Bank was uh, Mr. Broches, Ronnie Broches, uh, uh, of Dutch origin, a very capable and uh, <coughs> innovative man. And he decided to promote this initiative of establishing a convention which would enable investors to sue uh, host governments. And therefore, the issue was less one of how much compensation and rather uh, an issue of how to get the matter before an independent or impartial tribunal, which would then apply uh, international law, whatever it might be found to be. So uh, Ronnie developed this, this uh, convention, the Exit Convention of 1966, and, uh, <clears throat> which contained an important article, Article 42, relating to the law to be applied, which was, in effect, law to be implied was the law prescribed in the agreement between the investor and the receiving state, or if there wasn't such a, a provision, then it should be 
uh, the law of the investment receiving state, but coupled with applicable international law. So international law came by agreement to be uh, applicable directly in relations between a state and an individual, so that in terms of the theory of international law, which had previously always been that international law was a law between states, it was now accepted that international law could also be directly applicable between a state and, and, and an individual investor. Uh, at first, there weren't very many uh, cases in the ICSID system, but it has now uh, exploded, and uh, the current dossier of the uh, ICSID system, I think, covers more than 150 cases, so that it's a major air, air, air field of international litigation under the development of international law. The, the arbitrators are always uh, people of, of standing in the field, and so one has had a, a very interesting uh, problem arise, namely, what, what, how does one resolve differences in the expression of views between various distinguished arbitrators? And the answer is there is no uh, ready-made answer. One simply has, uh, if one is a, an arbitrator coming to the same problem, which has already been determined in two different ways by two other arbitrators, the other arbitrator, or the later arbitrator, <coughs> cannot simply say uh, there is precedent for this, because the precedents go both ways. He has to sort it out for himself, and hopefully uh, an accumulation of precedent in one direction, or an accumulation of decisions, I should say, in one direction, may, may form a, a, a precedential series. So <coughs> then uh, there were these early ICSID cases. It happens that in 1970 I took silk, and that is to say I became a QC. Now, for an academic to become a QC in those days was a, a, a very rare event, and I should emphasize that I was applied for and was granted silk not on the basis that I was an academic, but that I was a, a practicing barrister. Nowadays, it has become the practice to award honorary QCs, honorary silk, to, to academics, a perfectly reasonable recognition of their distinguished position in the field. But in terms of an acknowledgement of their activity or prowess on the professional side, it does not really convey very much. But in 1970, my silk was what they call an earned silk and uh, was a reflection of the position that I had by then developed at the bar. Uh, <coughs> then, <coughs> in 1972, we had the, the oil crisis uh, when uh, the, the, uh, uh, the oil-producing countries established OPEC, the Organization for Petroleum Exporting Countries, and they... Uh, increased the price of oil considerably by unilateral action, uh, which was, for, on, for most part, in breach of the terms of the agreements that they had with the investors or the oil-producing companies. Uh, this gave rise to significant international economic consequences. And uh, uh, I... Uh, was much involved in the problems arising from that. My next-door neighbour in Cambridge at that time was Lord Rothschild, Victor Rothschild, who had recently been made uh, head of a new government institution called the uh, Central Policy Review Staff, or the Think Tank, which was uh, assigned to look into various aspects of governmental conduct without reference to divisions or, uh, or distinctions between departments, and to come up with suggestions. And uh, he, he was very much aware of the significance of the action of the oil-producing companies, and he asked me to uh, take on the role of giving international legal advice to the CPRS. So I became their consultant on international law uh, in, the, in the early 70s. One of the items on which I worked was the consequence of the uh, <coughs> agreement between Britain and Norway relating to the division of the uh, continental shelf uh, 
in the North Sea. And there, uh, uh, that division had taken place largely on the basis of a median line division or equidistance division between the Norwegian and the British coasts. I took the view that in the circumstances this was not the right line to adopt. The correct line would have been uh, to have taken into account the fact that the Norwegian continental shelf uh, broke off at a, in an area or, or along a line called the Norwegian trough, which was much closer to the Norwegian coast than the median line drawn in the sea. Therefore, if we adhered to the view that Norway was not entitled to continental shelf beyond the Norwegian trough, we would have got uh, a larger area of continental shelf, which, as it turns out, uh, or turned out later, contained a very large oil fields. But uh, the, the, the government had not taken that view, and I wrote this paper, a critical paper, called Billions Down the Trough, uh, which uh, went to Cabinet to inform them of, of the position. But, in fact, Great Britain never did seek an alteration of the line in the North Sea, as a result of which Norway has become much richer than it might otherwise have become. So, but uh, I had this very agreeable relationship with Victor Rothschild over the North Sea oil and other, other matters in the early 70s. And then, <coughs> round about that time, on the academic side, I began to nurture the idea of a biographical dictionary of international law, uh, which in international law terms would be comparable to the Dictionary of National Biography and would simply contain articles about various international lawyers of the past, not current ones, but ones who were no longer living. <coughs> that was a good idea, and I was helped uh, initially a lot by Francis Meadows and uh, one or two others. Uh, <coughs> but unfortunately, we couldn't, any of us, devote to the task the uh, detailed attention and time it required. So for the last uh, 35 years, uh, the scheme has languished. We, we have, if only somebody would come along and pick it up, uh, a great deal of basic material. And it needs uh, a, 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 a year or two of solid work by a good editor with the assistance of uh, contributors from various countries to put, pull it all together and provide us with a major contribution to the history of international law. But at that time, in 1973, I, I spent quite a bit of time on that. And there was nothing like it at the time. I'm sorry? There was nothing like it at the time. No, nothing like it at mm. the time, nor mm. indeed now. Mm. There, there isn't a, a biographical dictionary of international law. <coughs> then, uh, in uh, 1972, the there was a change of government in Australia and uh, the, the Labour government of Gough Whitlam came into power. Uh, they were very much opposed to the conduct of nuclear tests uh, by France on the island of Mururoa in the Pacific and they wanted it stopped. So uh, they sought help from various international lawyers, prominent among them being uh, the then professor at Oxford, uh, Dan O'Connell. And Dan O'Connell and I were instructed to, to <coughs> help the government in the formulation of a case in the International Court uh, intended to uh, require the, the French to stop their uh, experimental activity. The Australian contention was that this gave rise to nuclear fallout which spread and fell onto Australian territory and thus violated Australian sovereignty. Well, <coughs> uh, uh, the case uh, uh, came to a successful conclusion in the sense that the French uh, were led to uh, undertake unilaterally that they would discontinue the tests after uh, 1973 or 1974 uh, that is to say, they would discontinue uh, atmospheric nuclear testing, not that they would discontinue underground nuclear testing. And the continuation of that underground uh, 
nuclear testing led in due course to further proceedings initiated by New Zealand uh, to try and get them stopped by demonstrating that this underground testing could in due course uh, lead to the destruction of the Mururoa Island and the release into the atmosphere of significant amounts of uh, a polluting material. But that case uh, did not succeed because the court was not persuaded that this would actually happen. But in 1973, uh, the nuclear test case, as it started by Australia and New Zealand, was seen as a, a major development in environmental protection. Yes. And so I, I participated in that case quite actively. The, I, I worked very closely with the then uh, Australian Attorney General uh, um, Lionel Murphy, uh, a man of charismatic quality, and uh, his Solicitor General uh, Bob Ellicott, an absolutely first-class lawyer and advocate. And with them also in due course there was uh, Morris Byers who succeeded Bob Ellicott as Solicitor General. Uh, we had a very happy relationship. And then out of the blue one day, uh, the case being over, uh, Bob Ellicott telephoned to me from Australia and said that uh, Murphy and he, Ellicott, and uh, Gough Whitlam, the Prime Minister, had thought up the idea of having a proper legal, international legal advisor in the service of the Australian government with a, a rank and statutory status uh, comparable to that of the Solicitor General in Australia, who was a, a statutory a person. And they invited me to come out to Australia and assume that role. I wondered about that, Sir Eli. I, was, I wondered how you came to be the advisor to the Foreign Office yeah. in Australia. And, and so uh, <coughs> what, what, what happened was that Bob rang me up and said, will I think about it? And I said, well, look, I, I, I can tell you straight away, uh, I'm very happy doing what I'm doing, the academic work and the, the, <coughs> the, the professional work in the UK, and I don't think I would like to, to come out. And uh, then three weeks later, uh, Bob ran me up and said, well, here's another thought. What about coming out for three or five years? And I said to him straight away on the telephone, I could not refuse three years, and we agreed on three years, and in due course, at the end of 1974, uh, I went out to Australia with my wife and uh, three children to assume the position of legal advisor of the Department of Foreign Affairs. And in those three years, 75, 76 and 77, I was enormously active, uh, both on the uh, governmental and diplomatic side, in terms of international law, and also in trying to uh, pull together uh, the, the academic side of international law teaching in Australia. At the end of the, the three years, the Australian government asked me if I would like to continue. And I said, I would love to, but I think not. I think I'd better go home. I took the decision to come here for three years, and I'd better stick to that, because I'm already learning the tricks of the trade here. And that is to say, I would soon know only too well how to, how to achieve my objectives, which might not always suit those around me. So I left Australia at the end of 1977 on very good terms with the Australians, having, I think, done a, a lot of work for them. Uh, uh, included in that work were, uh, was one minor and one major item. The minor item <coughs> was the uh, participation in the negotiation of the bilateral treaty of friendship with Japan, the so-called Nara Treaty of 1975-76. I went out to, to Japan very soon after my uh, assumption of uh, position in Australia to help in the negotiation of that, the principal negotiator being an excellent man called Michael Cook, who was the first assistant secretary in charge of the, the Asian section of the department. Uh, that, that was a very interesting situation because the, the dispute really centered on 
the extent to which we were prepared to incorporate into the treaty the concept of equitable treatment, there being no objective standard of what is meant by equitable treatment. Well, eventually they, they put it in, and there was a, a fair amount of discussion exactly to, as to exactly what it meant afterwards. That was a, a, a lesser item. Oh, there was another quite fun item also at the very beginning of my time in Australia. Two Australian businessmen uh, had fled uh, to, <coughs> um, to Paraguay, first to Brazil, then to Paraguay, to escape prosecution for company fraud in Australia. And I was sent out to Paraguay to try and negotiate their return. Uh, and uh, I arrived in, uh, the, the issue there was whether the extradition treaty that had been concluded between Britain and Paraguay some years previously extended also to Australia, having regard to Australia's subsequent emergence into uh, international independence. Well, uh, the, I, the problem was quite quickly solved because within 24 hours of my arrival, I'd seen the Paraguayan foreign minister who was perfectly happy to put his signature to, to a, an exchange of notes in which we confirmed the applicability of the treaty. Well, that was a nice, a nice uh, uh, adventure, flying out from Australia to, to Paraguay, not a, a very straightforward journey. Then <clears throat> the other and most important activity during my period in Australia was my participation as deputy leader of the Australian delegation in the ongoing Law of the Sea conference. That conference grew out of the work of the International Law Commission on the codification of the Law of the Sea. And in 1967, I think it was, uh, the idea of a conference to codify, uh, to, to pick up the work of the International Law Commission and translate it into an international convention uh, took root and there had been some meetings and eventually uh, there was a meeting in uh, Caracas in 1971 or I say 72 and then it carried on and by the time I got to Australia in 1975 the, the whole process was in full swing and so I, I accompanied the delegation to the next session of the Law of the Sea Conference in Geneva in the spring of 1975 and spent several weeks there uh, in the negotiation. And well, that was a very interesting time because <coughs> you had these various interest groups uh, all concerned to, to promote their particular concerns. And it was my first exposure to the realities of such a multilateral negotiation and in particular the role of the group of 77 uh, who, who had their interests to promote, uh, the, the group of landlocked states and so on. <coughs> it was a, a, a great lawmaking uh, activity which simply deserves its own story. But I spent on my three years in Australian service a considerable amount of my time on the Law of the Sea negotiations. And then combined with them uh, in an activity which also took me away from Australia uh, quite a lot of the time was uh, my role as Australia's representative in the Sixth Committee of the uh, meetings of the General Assembly of the United Nations, the Sixth Committee being the legal committee. And, uh, and there I had to uh, uh, play a role particularly in the consideration of the annual reports of the International Law Commission and, in, and uh, an indication or suggestion as to how the Commission might continue its business. Uh, those three years in Australia were very, very satisfying and, uh, and very uh, well filled. Were you involved in Antarctica at this point? Sorry? Sorry? Were you involved in Antarctica at this point? Oh, yes, thank, thank you for reminding me. Yes, Antarctica was uh, one of the issues that I had to deal with. And there, uh, I think. I brought a certain influence to bear, which was quite important, because at one point in, in, in my period there, one of the senior officials in the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs, 
was urging Australia, which as you will remember, was one of the principal claimants of territory in Antarctica, to give up its claim in the interests of what was then called the common heritage of mankind. In other words, to vest it in the United Nations. This was a, a reflection of an initiative of, of the government of Malaysia. <coughs> I uh, suggested to the Australian government that this would be a mistake. I said, you really have no right now in 1970, well, it must have been 1975, four or five, uh, to give up your claim to Antarctica when you do not know what there may be in Antarctica that may be of significance to you, in particular what, what mineral reserves there may uh, lie under the ice. Uh, many people at that time said, well, so what? I mean, it's deep under the ice, you'll never be able to get at it. Uh, as events have turned out now in the ensuing uh, decades, uh, the possibility of ultimately being able to, to uh, exploit Antarctic mineral resources is a, 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 a real one. And subsequent to my return from Australia, when I was no longer involved, uh, there was negotiated a convention for uh, the, the <coughs> treatment of Antarctic mineral resources. So I, I uh, argued very strongly that Australia should not give up its claim to Antarctica, and it did not. So it is still one of the principal claimants. Of course, its conduct is limited by the terms of the Antarctic Treaty of 1958, uh, and the, the vital need for the preservation of the Antarctic environment. Uh, my my uh, <coughs> argument to the Australian government was that nothing should affect that, but that you simply should not give up your claim uh, to title. Interesting. And then, <coughs> amongst the other things in which I was involved during my time in Australia, was the development of a, an initiative in the General Assembly on multilateral treaty making. Uh, I thought that it might be helpful if we could establish uh, various techniques to assist countries, particularly developing countries, uh, to, to, to uh, consider and ultimately adopt multilateral conventions that had been produced in international conferences, but which were, so to speak, languishing by reason of non-ratification. Uh, I was only able to take that initiative uh, part of the way before my time in Australia ended, and I f fear it rather uh, withered away after I left. Then uh, the other interesting item was the negotiation between Australia and Papua New Guinea regarding maritime delimitation between those two countries. And my, uh, again, it was a, a negotiation in which I could only play a limited part because I, I, I left the government service while it was still going on. But I did succeed in leaving behind me an idea which subsequently has been applied in other places as well, the idea of drawing curtains. That is to say, you would uh, simply, uh, instead of trying to do an equidistance line, uh, you simply drop a line, uh, a north-south line or something like that from the appropriate points on the coasts of the states so as to embrace their respective maritime claims. So that brings me to the... Uh, no, no, it doesn't quite bring me to the end of, of that period because uh, even while I was working on the uh, Central Policy Review Staff Matters, and the nuclear test cases, and nurturing the Biographical Dictionary of International Law, uh, <coughs> I was engaged in a, a rather substantial arbitration between uh, British Petroleum and Libya relating to the expropriation by Libya of BP's interests in that country. And uh, that reached a, a conclusion in 1970 four, which is reported in the International Law Reports, volume 53, page 297. Interesting case, but uh, very detailed. And uh, also, uh, it, it gave rise to uh, an issue as to the, the correct way in which the arbitrator uh, 
uh, should exercise his powers. And that, that was all time-consuming. And, <clears throat> and then also alongside all of this, I became involved in the earlier stages of another dispute between Chile and Argentina, one relating to the boundary in the Beagle Channel. There again, I worked with Sir Humphrey Wardock, and we, we had a very interesting visit to the region. Uh, we flew from Santiago down to Punta Arenas, and there we uh, got onto a Chilean destroyer to sail southwards through the Coburn Channel into the Beagle Channel, and then to Puerto Williams, a, a Chilean port on the main island of Tierra del Fuego, and where I transferred into a, a motor torpedo boat to go and visit the three disputed islands in the Beagle Channel, Picton, Lennox That's and Nueva. Places most people don't can only dream about. Oh, all very, very interesting. And uh, <laughs> it's it really quite fun because two things. First of all, the Chilean Navy cooks were not really very good. And so they had beautiful fresh fish, which they caught uh, in the sea, but uh, they, they mauled in the cooking process. However, to, to offset that, there was always plenty of wine, red and white, on the table. And I must say that the uh, constant mixture of the two didn't improve my mental faculties <laughs> while, while involved in it. I shared a cabin with Sir Humphrey Waldock. He had the lower bunk, and I had the the upper bunk, and across the, the, the passage there was another cabin which was occupied by my instructing solicitor, John Warford, and uh, a Chilean uh, professor of international of substantial dimensions. He had the upper bunk, John had the lower one. During the night I was conscious of a great deal of activity going on outside our cabin, and learned the following morning that the Chilean professor, having got up during the course of the night to go down the corridor, when, on climbing back into his bunk, the chains that held the bunk up parted, and the bunk came crashing down, <laughs> luckily not hitting uh, John Walford. But there was no other bunk into which he could be replaced. The, the, the ship was full. And so, in the middle of the night, they had to call up the ship's engineers to, to weld together the chains and restore the bunk to its professor holding capacity and uh, it was, it was a, a great adventure but the islands were simply beautiful I remember um, actually landing on Picton, Lennox and Nueva and on one of them I can't remember which one now there was a graveyard on a cliff overlooking the sea we were very fortunate because at that time of year when the sea would normally have been rather rough a great calm prevailed and I stood in this cemetery overlooking the sea and thinking, how marvellous uh, to be buried here in an area of such total tranquillity. But it's still I, not settled, is it, Sir Eli? This dispute is still not resolved, is it? Oh, yes, it is resolved. Is it? Um, what happened was that a very distinguished arbitral tribunal sat to consider the matter, uh, consisting of Sir Gerald Fitzmaurice, Judge Stuart Petren of Norway, and I... I've forgotten for the moment who the third member was, but it was a powerful tribunal, and they reached a conclusion very favourable to Chile. Oh. And this was not acceptable to Argentina, who indicated <coughs> that he would not accept it. And uh, the two countries came close to conflict. At this point, the, the Pope intervened, and there was a papal mediation, which led to a, a satisfactory result. Uh, involved some adjustment of the the uh, decision of the tribunal, particularly to to encompass Argentina's concern at the area of Atlantic Ocean that it was receiving. So that there has been a successful outcome, though not quite what the arbitrators determined on the basis of a strictly legal approach to the question of title. Interesting. So we come now to uh, my return from Australia and uh, the first thing that happened there was that of course I came to an England where my, my practice had withered away because I'd gone away but um, 
I was greatly helped by Herbert Golsong, who was <coughs> uh, at that time the uh, vice president of the World Bank and their, their general counsel, who uh, set up uh, the World Bank Administrative Tribunal uh, to, to do, resolve disputes between the bank and its staff. And so I was appointed a member of that tribunal and remained a member for many years, uh, eventually becoming vice president and then president of the tribunal. Uh, and I, I left the tribunal, I suppose, about ten years ago. Mm. And uh, But uh, I left it, I think, in better shape than I found it because I secured for it a, an excellent executive secretary, uh, Nassib Ziade, who had been here at Cambridge, one, one of our Cambridge Mafia, and he he is there uh, at present. Uh, so I, I, I dealt with that tribunal. Of course, it was very, very interesting work. Uh, unfortunately, the uh, although there are books on uh, international administrative law, uh, none of them reflect the exceedingly detailed and interesting discussions that took place within the tribunal prior to the adoption of a decision. And the decisions themselves don't say all that much, but it is the discussions that preceded them that would, if properly written up, have, uh, with all due regard to confidentiality, of course, have, I think, uh, would have been of great interest to people. Uh, then, uh, <coughs> uh, shortly after my return from Australia, uh, I was asked by the uh, president of the International Monetary Fund whether I would like to go to the fund as its legal counsel. Now, this was a, a very uh, tempting invitation, but quite daunting. The, the International Monetary Fund had, until that time, had as its general counsel, and had for many years previously had as its general counsel, uh, a, a remarkable individual, uh, um, Tommy Gold, not Tommy Gold, uh, 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 Joseph Gold. Yeah, I think it was Joseph Gold. I, I'm not quite sure now what his first name was for some reason, but uh, Gold was their general counsel. Uh, he was a considerable economist, and he had um, developed a, a very advanced technical knowledge of the work of the International Monetary Fund, uh, and had written books about it and articles and he was reaching the, uh, the the retiring age. It was he who had recommended me to the the, the uh, president of the fund, and the president saw me in London and asked me if I'd like to take the job. And I reflected and I said, no, I thought not, because it was not the kind of law that I was used to dealing with. I would have been out of my depth. Uh, I couldn't do the same job as, as, as Joseph Gold. And... Uh, so I, I didn't take it. I just remained as I had been before, uh, a, a, an academic and a practitioner. Was that a hard decision for you, Sir Eli? Did, did you mull over it for some time? Did I? Did you, did you have to think about it for some time before you no, came to your decision? No, no. I, I, I disposed of it quite quickly. I, I mean, I knew what I was capable of and what I was, was not capable of. And <clears throat> in pursuit of my academic ambitions. At about that time, uh, the chair of international the London School of e Economics became vacant uh, on Ian Brownlee, I think, going to Oxford. And uh, I was one of the candidates for that chair. I have to say that my failure uh, was the most honourable failure I could have uh, hoped for. They appointed instead Rosalind Higgins, and she has been absolutely first class in that position. Uh, she she um, brought to it uh, great academic talent, uh, a good lecturer, uh, excellent writer, and at the same time combined uh, with it uh, an active practice in international law at the bar in London. So uh, although I was disappointed at the time, I could see the virtue of their selection of her. And as you know, in due course, uh, she became uh, a candidate for and was elected to the International Court of Justice, where she is, still is uh, as president. Mm. 
And one thing I did on the side when I came back from Australia was to cope with the problem of the publication of the international law reports. As I told you, uh, this was a series of, of which I took over the editorship upon the, the death of my father in 1960. And uh, I had uh, the problem of, of uh, keeping it going. Now, I'd, I'd had great editorial help from <coughs> uh, Gillian White until she went to Manchester as professor. On returning from Australia, I had to um, find a new assistant, and uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, uh, find Christopher Greenwood, who was then uh, just finishing his uh, postgraduate work at Cambridge. And he came on board, and he has had a remarkably successful career in international law, happily continuing the whole time with the uh, assistant uh, assisting me on the international report and in effect virtually uh, assuming total responsibility as my own ability to 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 contribute declined with other pressures uh, Chris has, has done a marvelous job he's now a joint editor and in the meantime he's become a professor of international at the London School of Economics in succession to Ros Higgins and uh, is now uh, the British candidate for election to the International Court when Ros Higgins's term expires in February of next year. Uh, so I had, that, that was how I dealt with the editorial side of the ILR. But the publishers, Butterworths, had um, expressed some difficulties about the irregularity of the production of volumes by the editors and threatened to discontinue the publication. Whereupon I said to them, well, don't worry about that. I'll, I'll publish it myself. So I took over the publication side of the ILR, creating a company which is called Grotius Publications Limited for that purpose. And so Grotius Publications took on the publication of the ILR and also began to develop <coughs> a sideline of publishing other books on international law and acquired a good reputation in so doing. Well, by 1993, I'd say within 15 years of creating Crocious, uh, I realized that what I originally started simply as a hobby was going to become a rather larger task. We couldn't go on uh, in, in cottage industry publication as I saw it. And uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, I sold it to the Cambridge University Press, which used it as the foundation for its own subsequent, very successful uh, development of a, a, a legal title list. Yes. So, Grotius Publications, unfortunately, the name has disappeared, except it still appears on the back it's of the volumes of the International Law Report. Yes. Well, so, Ellie, uh, Shall we stop there? Let, let us, that would be a good place to stop. Um, next time we can begin with the 80s, which were a, an important decade for you personally. In Alia, you set up the Lauterbach Research Centre, and we'll deal with that next time. So all that remains is for me to thank you very much for this interesting interview. Thank and we'll you. come back. To the, there's, there's quite a lot left. Yes. My goodness, how? Yes, yes. <laughs> L- Lovely. Very good. Thank you. Well, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, sir. I'm just going to stop this.